welcome to uh, session nine of our study through Nehemiah. Uh, this is um, a look at chapter eight, a portion of chapter eight, <coughs> and it's titled, uh, What's a Preacher to Do? You know, everybody has an opinion about preaching, even preachers. It's said that uh, Abraham Lincoln said something fascinating about preaching. Uh, many of the things he said were fascinating. The following quote is attributed to him about preaching. He said, I don't like to hear cut, canned, dried sermons. When I hear a man preach, I like to see him act like he was fighting bees. Well, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, I guess I've seen some guys that look like they were fighting bees. There was a new preacher in a congregation, and he he just asked the people, what should I preach about? And the answer came back, about heaven and about 15 minutes. Uh, there was a stranger that came to church one time, and the preacher was pleased to see him come forward and sit in one of the empty seats. And afterward, he greeted this newcomer and said, I'm glad you, you felt free to sit well forward, even though you're a visitor. And the man said, well, I'm a bus driver, and I just wanted to see if I could learn how you can get everyone to the rear all the time. You might remember the story of, uh, of Jesus, Mark chapter 4, the time when he used uh, a boat as his pulpit. People gathered along the seashore and, and listened to him preach, and, and he taught, of course, many things in parables. And the one example that's given there in Mark 4 is the story of the sower and the seeds and the soils. And that story is really a, a, a big reminder to all of us who preach and all who teach that try as hard as we might, some will not hear it, at least not very well or effectively. And at the conclusion of that particular sermon that Jesus preached, he put the onus on the crowd, and he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, a lot of times it's a temptation for preachers and teachers to put the onus on ourselves. Um, put a lot of pressure on ourselves, and sometimes it, it can cause us to err in our efforts to say something in some way that perhaps more will listen and more will respond. And then sometimes churches even put the onus on their preachers, and if a preacher fails to do well enough or tickle enough ears, it can become a very difficult situation. Uh, one time I, I read a couple of articles, it's not been that long ago, um, that reflected on this and got me to thinking about um, this particular message. The articles talked about the sometimes tough situations that preachers face when considering how to preach and what to preach. And uh, before I share some of the quotes from those articles, just for you Lancaster folks, I want you to understand that uh, I have no complaints about the way you've treated me as your preacher. Uh, you've been very kind and generous to me and very supportive. And so uh, I'm, I'm really preaching this, I'm teaching this lesson because it comes up next in the text and not because of some great uh, raging problem here. Um, I wish that everybody had people like you to preach to each week. There would be a lot more happy preachers out there and a lot more that stick around for the long term. But the two articles that, that I refer to had interesting titles. One was entitled, Yawning at the Word, and the other was entitled, Falling on Deaf Ears, Why So Many Churches Hear So Little of the Bible. Um, the first one, Yawning at the Word, was written by a guy named Mark Golly, and I just um, highlighted a couple of quotes from his article that I wanted to, to share with you. 
he says the following, Mark Golly, when I preach, I often quote the Bible to drive home my point. I think it's more persuasive to show that what I'm saying is not merely my opinion, but a consistent theme of Scripture. And so, to avoid the impression that I'm proof texting or lifting verses out of context, I quote longer passages, anywhere from two to six verses. When I did this once at a church, a staff member whom I'd asked for feedback between services told me to count to cut down on the scripture quotations. You'll lose people, he said. I understood the reality he was addressing, and so I scratched out the biblical references for the next sermon. But lately I'm beginning to question that move and wondering why have we become so impatient and bored with the word of God? I ask this not in a scolding tone, but in wonderment, not to point figures, fingers, for I wonder at myself as well. A little bit later in the article, he says this, It's been said, to the point of boredom, that we live in a narcissistic age, where we are wont to fixate on our own needs, our wants, our wishes, and our hopes, at the expense of others, and certainly at the expense of God. We do not like it when a teacher uses up the whole class time presenting the material, even if the material is from the Word of God. We want to be able to ask our questions about our concerns. Otherwise, we feel talked down to, or we feel the class is not relevant to our lives. It is well and good for the preacher to base his sermon on the Bible, but he better get to something relevant pretty quickly, or we start to mentally check out. Don't spend a lot of time in the Bible, we tell our preachers, but be sure to get to personal illustrations, examples from daily life, and most importantly, an application that we can use. It's easy to see how this culture has profoundly shaped the dynamics of preaching and teaching. All the demands have been placed on the shoulders of the preacher. So anxious are we to meet needs and stay relevant. No longer are listeners Listeners ask to listen humbly to the proclamation of God's word in all its mystery and glory. To be sure, we want the preacher to begin with the word. We're Christians, after all, but only as a starting point and only as long as he moves on to the things that really interest us. That, again, was an article written by Mark Golly. The other author was uh, Al Moeller, and he wrote this article entitled, Falling on Deaf Ears, Why So Many Churches Hear So Little of the Bible. And just a selection or two from this article. He says, In many churches there is very little reading of the Bible in worship, and sermons are marked by attention to the congregation's concerns, not by inadequate attention to the biblical text. The exposition of the Bible has given way to the concerns, real or perceived, of the listeners. The authority of the Bible is swallowed up in the imposed authority of congregational concerns. And then he says, in another place, the fix fixation on our own sense of need and interest looms as the most significant factor in this marginalization and silencing of the word. Individually, each human being in the room is an amalgam of wants, needs, intuitions, interests, and distractions. Corporately, the congregation is a mass of expectations, desperate hopes, consuming fears, and impatient urges. All of this adds up, unless countered by the authentic reading and preaching of the Word of God, to a form of group therapy entertainment, and wasted time, if not worse. And then lastly, he says, In many churches there is almost no public reading of the Word of God. Worship is filled with music, but congregations seem disinterested in listening to the reading of the Bible. Well, they point out some concerns that, that many preachers have, and the question is, what's a preacher to do? Um, when you have all these societal pressures that bear down on us and um, something I think we'd all admit to, short attention spans, 
And when we have sometimes even impatience with the public reading of the Word of God, what do you do? And, and so part of this message is sort of relaying my conviction, what I think, and where I'm coming from, uh, just so you'll know. Um, I have decided, and I've done this for some time as a preacher, uh, to do all I can to encourage the public reading of Scripture in our assemblies. And so normally in, in just about any sermon I preach, um, I will read a text from Scripture, at least one text, and, and then somewhere elsewhere in the time of worship we will do a public reading from Scripture, uh, perhaps from a passage related to the sermon, or, or maybe not. And the reason we do that, and then often many of our men who um, lead communion thoughts will read from Scripture. So several times we're reading from the Bible. The reason we do that is at least in part in obedience to passages like 1 Timothy 4.13, where Paul says to the younger preacher Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation, to teaching. And I really think we ought to obey that passage. And, uh, you know, when I think of what I do and how I do it as a preacher of God's Word, I really think I ought to take my cues from the Word of God um, and, and not from society and not from what is currently in vogue in cultural communication techniques, and not even what you, my hearers, want me to do. Although, again, I stress, I, I am constantly encouraged by you, and, and you support me, and so I'm not complaining about any personal thing. I'm just um, expressing to you my view about it. And so one passage that's really important to me as I think about this and what a preacher is to do, it's an old one. Uh, it's an Old Testament one, but it is close. It's as close as anything in the Bible to describing a preaching service as we have come to know it over the centuries. Uh, you won't find too many things like what we do when we assemble in the New Testament, uh, you know, an assembly like that described. Uh, but there is one in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. And uh, the preacher on this particular occasion is a man named Ezra. Ezra was a scribe. He was a teacher of the law. And so he, by definition, knew the book. And a day came when he had an audience in Jerusalem that he had been called on to speak to. And this is uh, located in Nehemiah chapter 8 and the first eight verses. I'm going to ask you to, to listen or follow along as I read this text. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshullam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, 
for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Again, that's Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 8. And I have to confess, as I read through that, um, the temptation was there to skip over all those names. Because, uh, you know, the pressure is on me as a communicator, uh, as a preacher, uh, to keep your attention. And a list of names like that can be difficult. It's just the nature of our day and age. But uh, I plowed through them and hope I didn't lose you. And, and I'm sure that you followed. But it's such an interesting scene to me as a preacher this particular day in Jerusalem when all the people were gathered together in this public place. They're outdoors in a public square. There are no pews. There's no heat. There's no AC. Uh, for about six hours, it says that Ezra read from the law to the people and that, that they stood and listened and they paid attention. Six hours. Think about that. And they did more than just listen to Ezra read the Bible. They worshipped. Uh, it says that Ezra blessed the Lord. That's worship. And the people joined in. They responded. And so at times they bowed their heads, and at times they lifted their hands, and at times they got down in the dirt and put their faces on the ground, and, and they said amen at times. This was a full worship service, you see. It was not just a public reading session, and it was not just Ezra standing up and speaking the entire time. In fact, I hope you can see that it very much sounds like the kind of thing we do when we assemble on Sunday. And uh, on this occasion, no doubt, there were many hundreds of people in this assembly, this outdoor assembly, maybe even thousands. So um, all those names that we read through in the passage, uh, you realize, don't you, what they were doing? All those names, all those people? They were, in essence, teaching Bible classes, little smaller groups. Uh, look again at verse 7 there and notice that. And then verse 8 is really the verse that I most wanted to get to, to to help you see sort of my philosophy. And it's not just mine. Many people have this view. Uh, but what I try to do as a preacher when I consider this question of what's a preacher to do, this is the answer that I've discovered from God's Word. And it's, again, verse 8. It says there, They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's what a preacher is supposed to do, as I understand it. I am to read from the Word of God in a clear way and try to explain it so that people can understand it. Because it's really not about me and what I think. You know, I have no authority in myself except as the Word of God is in me and as it is faithfully related through the vehicle in my voice box. Uh, and so 
my hope and prayer is that we will always be a people who want to and indeed demand to hear the word of God when we assemble and who indeed are eager to hear it and are willing to listen to it so that when we leave assembly, we can go out and we can live it and we can even share it and thus we can be prepared for the return of the Lord one day. That's what I think a preacher is to do and what we as listeners are to do. May it ever be that way among us. Thank you for listening to this session. God bless.